When Mississippi seceded in January of 1861, Jefferson Davis left Washington, D.C. to resume his role as a Southern planter. History, though, would have a very different destiny for Davis, and within two months of his return home, he stood on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol and delivered his inaugural address as President of the Confederate States of America. For four years, he was the Chief Executive and Commander-in-Chief trying desperately to preserve the Constitution in the midst of invasion. By late 1864, as the war is entering its final phase, arguably the greatest accomplishment of the, of the Davis administration is simply the fact that the Confederacy was still alive in 1864. On paper, it shouldn't have been. The war between the states quickly became one of attrition, and the North's vastly greater resources finally overpowered the South. As Richmond fell and Confederate armies surrendered in the field, Davis conducted his government from horseback and even signed documents from the side of the road. But the Confederate States of America ended exactly 51 months after it began, when President Jefferson Davis was captured in the woods of South Georgia by Union troops. After Davis's capture in Irwinville, he was brought to Macon, Georgia, where a crowd that included future President Woodrow Wilson filled the streets. From there, Davis was reunited with his family, and they headed north by ship. He was held on the Clyde for a couple of days while the U.S. government tried to figure out what to do with this man whom they saw as the arch villain the man in persona who had caused this whole civil war, or if he hadn't caused it, had, had not ended it more quickly. The Union military under Secretary of War Edwin Stanton took control of Jefferson Davis, declaring him a prisoner of state. Though privately, the United States government was completely unsure of what exactly to do with Davis. So Stanton appointed Brigadier General Nelson Miles to handle the immediate task of imprisoning Jefferson Davis at Fortress Monroe. He was the most important prisoner ever held by the United States government. Miles, always looking to extend his authority a little bit more, requested perhaps the permission to put the prisoner in shackles if it were necessary. On May 22, 1865, Davis was transferred from the Clyde and officially imprisoned at Fortress Monroe. It was also decided that this prisoner was of such importance that the guard level would be extraordinary. There would be a light burning constantly in his cell. There would be a sentinel who would be in his cell, standing in the cell. Outside the cell would be two more sentinels who were armed, plus an officer who would observe Davis and his every movement every 15 minutes. Davis had no privacy whatsoever. Miles, for no real apparent reason, one can only say to humiliate Davis, decided a couple of days after Davis is in Fort Monroe to put manacles on his feet. Davis strongly protested his shackling just as he had the chaining of Black Hawk some 30 years before. From the start, General Miles and Jefferson Davis would be at great odds, the young general relentlessly proving his command and Davis determined to preserve his dignity. Word of that got out very quickly 
We, we don't really know how, but it went through some sort of a grapevine. And three days later, there was an article in the Philadelphia paper saying that Davis had been manacled. Two days later, it had reached the New York papers. And two days later, New York uh, Northern leaders were wiring the War Department saying, did you really manacle Jefferson Davis? Was it necessary to do so? Jefferson Davis, in part, became a sort of a football with the internecine warfare within the Republican Party growing out of the Republican uh, break with the President Andrew Johnson. Whatever President Johnson did, one eye was cast on Jefferson Davis. Now, within Johnson's own cabinet, there was a wide divergence of opinion about what to do. There were those who thought Davis shouldn't even be tried. There were those who thought Davis should be tried before a military tribunal. So there was a wide difference of opinion on what to do with Davis. And amongst the congressional Republicans, who tended to be more sectionally radical, or more involved with sectional issues than President Johnson was, uh, people thought Davis ranged from everywhere he should be shot and never let out of jail. But President Andrew Johnson felt tremendous political pressure to move toward reunification and begin reconstructing the South. So in May of 1866, he proclaimed amnesty for all ex-Confederates except those who held highest rank, a group that included his old political enemy, Jefferson Davis. President Johnson, though, did welcome back Davis as vice president, Alexander Stevens, and some Confederate cabinet members who all personally sought individual pardons. It would have been unthinkable for Jefferson Davis to ask for pardon, which was the first step to securing, once again, the full rights of citizenship, rights to vote, to hold office, and so on. The southern states were not wrong in seceding. They were standing up for their rights in a lawful and constitutional way. Therefore, how can he apply for pardon for something that did not require pardon? So Jefferson Davis faced the charge of treason. Under the Constitution, an act punishable by death. They were very concerned about bringing Davis to trial. He would be tried in Richmond, Virginia, because the Constitution says if you commit treason, you have to be tried where the treason is committed. Richmond was where he was. The federal government worried that if it brought Davis to trial in Richmond, it might lose. All it would take would be one juror who might be a Confederate sympathizer, who might be pressured or intimidated by Davis sympathizers, and the whole case would be lost. And then that not only would lose with Davis, but for the federal government to lose a case about secession was treason was not something they wanted to contemplate because that would break down the whole legal edifice about secession. Some Republicans believed that he should never have been charged with treason anyway, that he simply was following the dictates of his conscience, and some of them, in fact, believed that secession was authorized by the Constitution. So they saw the trial as a no-win situation, really. I mean, what would be gained by putting Davis on trial or even executing him? It would just make him a martyr, more of a martyr, to the South, and the point was to try to get the Southerners back on board, not to alienate them even further. It just became such a hot political topic that I think they were more than willing to find a nice legalism to let him go and hopefully be seen no more. Unfortunately for the federal government, the gears of the legal system began grinding and federal judge John Underwood was given the Jefferson Davis case. The Supreme Court under Chief Justice Solomon B. Chase was very concerned though. They realized that a Davis victory in court would send the deeply wounded country back into unrest. Justice Chase knew that many Americans, both Northern and Southern, believed in the right of secession. He was never comfortable with the idea that the Civil War was just. That, that, that he felt that in a court of law, a, full, a very capable attorney could win victory for uh, Davis, which would be defeat for the Union. They would then be the aggressors. In trying to bring about a peaceful and uneventful reconciliation, the worst thing is to have to try the leaders of the now defeated rebellion on treason charges, and if they're convicted, to have to execute them, creating martyrs of them. 
As a result, it takes a while for Washington to decide what to do with Jefferson Davis, what charges to try him on, and then to deal with the issue of whether or not to try him, in fact. Refusing to allow Jefferson Davis to stand trial. Having, locked, having had this man locked up for two years, to have the Pope at that time send to Jefferson Davis a crown of thorns for fearing that the arrest of Jefferson Davis was as unjust as the crucifixion of Christ. He demanded, put me on trial, prove in a court of law that I have committed treason by declaring Southern independence. And of course, Salmon B. Chase would not allow him to appear in court. He was petrified that Davis would win in court what he lost on the battlefield. Think about how that would have changed everything. Across the country and all over the world, the story of Davis's imprisonment was spread by the determined pen of his wife, Verena. By focusing on the deterioration of her husband's health, Verena marshaled what started as sympathy for his shackling into outcry for his release. Verena Davis is a politician. She knows how to use public relations. She outmaneuvers General Nelson Miles, the commandant. Miles knows what she's doing. He writes to, to Washington, D.C. and says, can't we get reporters in here? Can't we get people in here to tell us what's actually happening in Fort Monroe? That they'd see that he's being treated fairly. They are being treated well in their terms. No, the War Department said, no, nobody can go in. So there's no objective view of what was happening to Davis in prison. There was his wife's hysteria, and there was a book called The Prison Life of Jefferson Davis. The book was the brainchild of two men, journalist Charles G. Halpine and Davis's physician at Fortress Monroe, Dr. John J. Craven. Both men were Democrats and ardent supporters of states' rights, and they also shared a concern that the Republican Party was concentrating too much power in the federal government they saw an opportunity in Jefferson Davis's prison plight to garner sympathy and support for the Democrats in the 1866 election. Halpine didn't care a whit about Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was just a convenience to use in describing how unfair, how, how barbaric the treatment of people could be by Republicans once they got in power. The prison life of Jefferson Davis made him the man he always wanted to be, the loving, gentle, kind soul, the man who, who had no hard feelings toward anyone. There were a lot of inaccuracies, so, much, so many inaccuracies, that Jefferson, through 180 marks in his book, Marginalia, said, this is fiction distorting fact. This isn't true. But the book had changed him. Now Southerners saw that their leader was suffering for their supposed sins. And that book then becomes an important part of who Davis is. Davis is the scapegoat of the South. He's the martyr to the cause. And consequently, Davis found himself cherished and celebrated by his people the way he had never felt them before the war. May 11, 1867, almost two years to the day after his capture, Jefferson Davis left Fortress Monroe for Richmond, Virginia. He was held under guard at the Spotswood Hotel, the same hotel where he stayed in 1861 after arriving as Confederate president. He goes into prison somewhat in very bad odor with the Confederate people. Many, you know, it's, it's easy to blame the president for losing. You have to blame somebody. You can't blame the, the heroes in gray. You can't blame all the generals, but you can blame the president. So he, he inherited, in a sense, all the, the sins of the Confederacy and bore them in the prison. And uh, if you want to be give your religious bent to it, it's almost as though that was his cross and he bore everything for the Confederate people. And when he came out, he was a hero. 
And remember, it was a surprise to him when he took that trip to Richmond, up the river. He couldn't understand why all these people were standing on the riverside cheering him. The last thing he anticipated. He wasn't even sure if people would speak to him, you know. On May 13th, 1867, Jefferson Davis arrived in federal court in Richmond, Virginia. Judge Underwood set the bail for Jefferson Davis at $100,000. Bond, though, was immediately posted by Northerners. Horace Greeley, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and abolitionist Garrett Smith. And finally, when it became politically possible, and Johnson had nothing to lose, uh, Grant was becoming president, people were losing interest in Jefferson Davis by 1869. And so the charges are quashed, not only against Davis, but against all remaining Confederates still facing treason charges, and Davis goes a free man. When Davis was released from prison, it was clear that the man who had started and led a country now had none to claim. He, Verena, and the children first moved to Canada, then to England in attempts to find a home and make a living. After trips back to New Orleans and Woodville, Mississippi in 1868, Davis reunited in Vicksburg with brother Joseph. And for the first time since the last year of the war, he returned to Virginia and visited his greatest general, Robert E. Lee. In all of his traveling over the next two decades, Jefferson Davis would never see his beloved city of Washington, D.C. again. He would never see the completed capital expansion he fought so hard to guide. He would never see the Smithsonian, the bastion of knowledge he had hoped would unite the country. And his voice, the voice of the antebellum South, would never be heard in the Senate chamber again. Jefferson Davis comes out of that a much cherished figure and a representation of the Southern position, the right of the Southern position in seceding. And in a way this will burden him for life because Davis is caught in his own myth. He cannot, he cannot easily put that aside and perhaps go into a commercial endeavor that would make him a lot of money. He's no longer the leader of the South, the, the, the uh, person who is going to take the South into this new position. He is the memory of the South, the collective memory of the cost of the Civil War on all Southern people. Other Confederates, though, would reintegrate into the United States, like Davis's former Vice President, Alexander Stevens, who would go on and govern Georgia, and also become a member of the United States Congress. Robert E. Lee would head a prominent university, cementing an already secure reputation. But for Jefferson Davis, the war between the states linked him forever to a past that had no practical future. He had no country, no land, no home. Yet he did have the responsibility to reconstruct a life for his wife, Verena, and their four children. Davis really lost everything in the war. His plantation had been abandoned and then seized by the Union Army, which continued to occupy it and lease it. He had no means of livelihood. He had no savings account that he could draw on. What money he had had been Confederate money, which of course was worthless. He had to find a job <coughs> to support himself and his family, relatively young family, all of whom needed to be educated, clothed, and fed. His whole life after the war was one long search for employment but he was never wealthy after the war, never. Just kind of got by. Taking his cue from successful Confederates abroad, such as Judah Benjamin, who prospered as Queen's Counsel in England, Davis and family sailed for Europe. But they had a terrible time keeping up socially when they were in England. They simply didn't have the money to buy the dresses and entertain and live in the nice places where they could mix as equals with the nobility of England or even the upper classes. So it was good and bad, bittersweet experience, I would say, for the most part. In 1869, Jefferson Davis returned to the United States alone. Verena and the children remained in Europe. This began one of several extended separations that the couple imposed on their marriage. And he took a job 
is president of a company called the Carolina Life Insurance Company. Well, it was called the Carolina Life Insurance Company. It's um, headquarters in Memphis. And he ran this company from 1869 to 1873. It was a regular insurance company. They had agents and such. Many of the agents were former Confederate soldiers. He got many Confederate soldiers to sign on to be agents. Of course, he was a, the Confederate president, commander-in-chief. And Davis worked hard at this. He had no experience in business, of course. And uh, when he moved to Memphis, his wife, Rena was back in England. He wrote to her and he told her, he says, I know you don't look forward to Memphis. And he says, you know, but times have changed. I don't have anything. Um, it's not being a planter. It's not even being the leader of a defeated people. Uh, but it's something that I must do. In 1870, Jefferson Davis went to England to bring Verena and his family back to Memphis. Husband and wife, once again, took comfort in the other. As they were readying to sail, though, they received the news of Brother Joseph Davis's death. My heart refused to surrender hope, and I crossed the Atlantic hopeful of being able again to embrace my mentor and benefactor. How bitter are the waters in which I am overwhelmed. Jefferson Davis, October 24th, 1870. In 1872, tragedy struck the Davises yet again. Their 10-year-old son, William, died in Memphis of diphtheria. This was the third son Jefferson Davis had buried. I thought of the bright boy I had at home, the hope and pride of my house. I have had more than the ordinary allotment of disappointment and sorrow. May God spare you all such sorrow as ours. Jefferson Davis, October 20th, 1872. Davis would have little time to grieve, though, because an economic downturn in the spring of 1873 jeopardized his new career. It failed in the Panic of 1873. Uh, the Panic, of course, is the word used in the 19th century for depression. It was a serious economic downturn. Many businesses went under in 1873. The Carolina Life Insurance Company went under in 1873. Davis lost his job, which was a well-paying job at that time. Uh, Davis also lost his investment in the company. The circumstances surrounding Jefferson Davis's departure from the Carolina Life Insurance Company made the transition even worse. The company wanted to restructure, but at the expense of all the current policyholders, Davis strongly objected and resigned out of principle, forfeiting any hope of ever seeing a dime from his tenure. I found everything I had destroyed or scattered. It was new to be in debt and knew to be without resources. The tide of my fortune is at its lowest ebb. I am too sad, too deep in anguish. Jefferson Davis, August, 1873. And he kind of bounces around. He can't find anything that is, that provides him en with enough money and also provides him with the dignity that he wants. You have to remember in a, Southern leadership eye to go into capitalism or to go into banking or industrialism is an anathema. That's what they had criticized about the North. And this man who, who is so proud and who, who was such a spokesman for the, the Southern view was not ready to open a factory someplace and, and head that factory. In the 1870s, Jefferson Davis was approached on several occasions to seek public office in the South. In 1874, he was offered the United States Senate seat from the state of Mississippi, but Davis declined this and every other offer related to public service. All that he'd seen and all that he had suffered during the war had pretty much jaundiced him on American politics in general. He had seen how politics and how politicians had failed their country, the old Union. He was not alone in this. There are a number of others, including some other prominent Confederates, who stayed out of politics after the war because they had seen how badly it had gone wrong. I am living quietly and have no desire to return to the vulgar scramble of the 
present state of politics, public life never had any other charm for me than the hope it offered of being useful. How futile that hope would be to me now. I do not desire nor intend to go to Washington. May God open the eyes of the people so that they may, before it's too late, preserve the liberty and local self-government their fathers of the revolution secured and left as a legacy to their posterity. Jefferson Davis, August, 1879. Davis stayed totally out of politics because I think he believed, and rightfully, I mean, he was correct in this, that he was looked upon as so controversial a person outside of the South. He was such a flashpoint that for him to get involved in any political activity overtly, uh, that it would condemn automatically anything he wanted to do, any cause he was connected with, any party he was connected with, any office he was connected with. If he had let it be known to the people of Mississippi, he could have been elected senator or congressman at, or governor at any point after the end of Reconstruction. But he stayed totally out of that, and I think he was very wise to do it. By 1877, Jefferson Davis had crossed the Atlantic Ocean no fewer than eight times since his release from prison. He and his family had moved from Virginia to Canada to Europe to the States and back again. He started the new year of 1877 alone in New Orleans, a rapidly aging man, unsure of what to do. Dearest Verena, this evening of our anniversary, when families are wont to be united, ours is scattered far and wide. It is sad to me to realize an ocean rolls between me and my dear Verena. I am so weary of wandering. Jefferson Davis, January, 1877. When Jefferson Davis in the mid-70s, after the, the demise of the Carolina Life Insurance Company, is looking for possible way to make a living to support his family, he thinks about Briarfield. He of course knew that Briarfield had been sold to some ex-slaves of Joseph E. Davis's and that they were trying to make a living from it and of course they were supposed to pay for these plantations and Davis would have supposedly reaped some financial benefit but they were never able to make really make a go of it on the plantations and uh, he often said that he could really sympathize with other Confederates who had lost everything. And he said that he too had lost everything and was willing to lose everything for his, except for his wife and children for the cause. For the better part of the 1870s, Jefferson Davis battled to regain control of his plantation, Briarfield. In 1878, he received an early 70th birthday present by securing ownership of the land. Davis placed all hope in repeating his pre-war financial success at the only occupation other than politics in which he excelled, a planter. But Davis's life had one prevailing pattern. The highest highs were always cut by the lowest of lows. And five months after the victory of Briarfield, Jefferson Davis, Jr., the last of his father's four sons, died in a yellow fever epidemic in Memphis, Tennessee. The last of my four sons has left me. I am crushed under such heavy and repeated blows. I presume not God to scorn, but the many and humble prayers offered before my boy was taken from me are hushed in the despair of bereavement. Jefferson Davis, September 1878. It's a family full of tragedies. And when I realized this, I, I've never been able really to tackle that, I must admit. How do you get around those personal tragedies, plus the professional tragedy of the war and what that cost the South? And maybe the only way to deal with it is to say, if I had to do it all over again, I would live my life just as I did. 
A longtime family friend, Sarah Dorsey, invited the Davis family to live on her Mississippi Gulf Coast estate called Beauvoir. For Jefferson Davis, it would provide the peace and security he so desperately needed to reflect and write his memoir. By 1877, uh, Davis is a man who is uh, approaching 70 years old. It's uh, not an age that most people can go out, start anew on something that's uh, quite different in their lives. And also at that time, he decided that if he ever wanted to make his great statement about the war and the nobility of the Confederate cause, now was the time to do it. His last hope was writing his memoir. He had seen so many others write memoirs that appeared to be profitable. His old nemesis, Joseph E. Johnston, published a memoir. His other old nemesis, Beauregard, published a memoir. And so Davis thought perhaps he could provide for his family by telling his story. While trying to write his grand recollection of the Confederacy at Beauvoir, Davis still had to deal with his plantation, Briarfield. But the plantation that Davis remembered from before the war was definitely not the briar field he tried to farm in the 1880s. Jefferson Davis in 1881 was past 70 years old. He lived at Beauvoir on the Mississippi coast, which was a good little trip up the Mississippi. You could go by train in New Orleans and take the steamboat from New Orleans up there, but it was a good, good trip. His wife wanted no part of living at briar field. She didn't like it before the war and after the war. It was now desolate and dingy, not an agricultural show place. Plus the landing, you had to go five or six miles through swampy territory to get there, and she had no interest at all in being there. He envisioned the, the old slaves at Briarfield working for him again, uh, but they didn't. Then there was the river. Uh, Briarfield was subject to floods. And in the 80s, floods came in on several occasions and ruined his crop. So he never succeeded as a planter. And the, the, the fortunate thing is he managed to hang on. And his family had the land when he died. Back at Beauvoir, Mrs. Dorsey developed cancer and died very quickly. Any rift that existed between Sarah and Verena, though, disappeared because Verena took care of Sarah up until her death. But Mrs. Dorsey, in her will of 1879, bequeathed Beauvoir to Davis. And so he inherited the whole thing. Not only did she leave him Beauvoir, she left him everything she owned. Caused a great furor in her family. They sued to break the will. That suit failed. And so Davis did own Beauvoir then, and he lived in Beauvoir. That was his home until the end of his life in 1889. Now, while he was there, he went there to write his memoir, and he worked on that, and he worked on that with Walthall. And in 1881, it finally came out, titled Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. Two quite lengthy tomes. There's a real industry after the war on war memoirs. They started almost immediately, and some of them were very good, and some of them were not very good. Joseph E. Johnston was one of the first of the major Confederate leaders to write his narrative of the war. Robert E. Lee had planned to, but of course died in 1870 and never did write his own accounts, which would have been quite wonderful, I'm sure. U.S. Grant wrote his memoirs, which were fabulously successful, not only because Grant was Grant, but because he also just turned out to be a born writer. The same terse and to-the-point orders that he had written during the war translated very well into a, a longer length study and people bought them like hotcakes and Davis of course observed this along with everyone else and thought aha here's a way to make some money because Grant's memoirs had been so successful. So he decided after long delay people had urged him to write after the war almost immediately after he got out of prison people urged him to write his history of the war. But what he ended up writing was a rather dry constitutional treatise. He did not really reveal much in the way of his own personal feelings, his own personal actions, his motivations, his goals. It simply was a, a very dry political monograph that did not prove terribly successful. They were well received by Southerners. I mean, reviews of it by Southerners were quite positive. 
Many northern reviews looked upon it as, you know, it is almost a historical document. That this talks about something that's long gone, and Davis's view of the Constitution was wrong to begin with, and the Confederates weren't noble. I mean, there was a sectional response to it in that sense. And uh, there's a there's a hundred pages or so in there on the whole issue of secession, uh, which I look at it as what would have been his legal defense had he ever gone to trial to defend to defend himself against treason, secession as treason. And so if you read that 100 pages or so, I think that essentially would have been his case. In addition to writing at Beauvoir, Jefferson Davis hosted visitors, both friends and political acquaintances, even international celebrities like Oscar Wilde, who met with the former president while on a speaking tour of the South. When Oscar Wilde arrived at Beauvoir, I'm sure Davis found him just totally unbelievable. Probably like, where did this person come from? <laughs> this is so totally unlike most of the other visitors who came there. And I'm sure also that he was very polite and courteous to Wilde, no matter how wild and crazy Oscar Wilde became. I think Verena undoubtedly was fascinated. She loved literary people and was very keen to be in their company and hear what they had to say and exchange conversation with them. Davis was too, really, in England. They both had a lot of very cultivated friends who were on the literary side. The visit left a lasting impression on Wilde, who felt that the South's struggle in the war was similar to his native Ireland's fight for independence. When later interviewed, he said, Jefferson Davis was a man of the keenest intellect with a personality as simple as it was strong and enthusiasm as fervent as it was faultless. He's popular in ways with the Southern people that he never was during the war or before it. He's constantly in demand after his release from incarceration for public speeches, to attend veterans events. He's offered the presidencies of a host of different Southern companies to be a figurehead, of course, but also to be a badge of honor on the letterhead of those companies. He's asked to be involved in the lotteries. He's asked to, to lend the, the moral weight of his name to almost every charity going on in the South from the 1860s through the 1880s. And where he can, he'll participate. Where he can, he will endorse all the good works going on in the South as it tries to rebuild itself and as he tries to rebuild himself. Because his martyr status doesn't end when he's released from prison. Davis, in his last years will spend two decades trying unsuccessfully to rebuild himself financially, trying to make his plantation work, which he can't, trying to run an insurance company, which fails, trying to become involved in railroads and a host of other enterprises, finally writing his memoirs in the hopes of providing some kind of living for his family. All of these things fail, and all of his failures are rather public. Everyone knows that he's out there striving, trying to overcome what all the rest of them are trying to overcome as they rebuild their own lives and rebuild the South, with the result that Jefferson Davis will become a minor cultural god to Southerners, especially after Robert E. Lee, their greatest deity, dies in 1870. After the death of Lee, there will be no other Confederate who will have such a hold on the hearts of the people whom Davis once led as Davis himself. In his later years, Jefferson Davis was seen more as an elder statesman and was asked to speak at various functions across the South. He delivered his last speech in Mississippi City in 1888 to a group of young men. Jefferson Davis was 80 years old and remarked that the reason for his attending was his hope for the country's youth. I feel no regret that I stand before you this afternoon, a man without a country, for my ambition lies buried in the grave of the Confederacy. The past is dead. Let it bury its dead, its hopes and its aspirations. Before you lies the future, a future full of golden promise, a future of expanding national glory before which all the world shall stand amazed. Let me beseech you to lay aside all rancor, all bitter sectional feeling, 
and to make your places in the ranks of those who will bring about a consummation devoutly to be wished, a reunited country. And he said these young people should be proud of their heritage, but he said they should not be entrapped by it. They should look to the future. They should be proud to be citizens of the United States. And he looked upon a bright and prosperous future of the United States, and these young people should participate fully, be proud of their Southern heritage, but not trapped by the past. So I think he did see that the future looked much brighter. And he wanted the Union to survive and to go forward and to flourish. So that's a very important one, the, the Mississippi City speech, where he urges everyone to work for a reunited country not think of the past all the time. To remember the past, honor the people who died for their causes, but, but you had to go forward. Repeatedly in the 1870s and 80s, Jefferson Davis, when he spoke publicly at all, would speak of pride in the Confederate heritage and what Southern men and Southern women had done, but he would also call for reconciliation. And there are other evidences in Davis's behavior in those later years that suggest that he meant it as in the case of his daughter, Winnie, who fell in love with a man who'd been a major in the Union Army, and the two became engaged. And Davis, though he would have preferred that his daughter fall in love with a former Confederate soldier, still did not withhold his permission from the marriage. The marriage never took place because the young man suffered severe financial reversal, but the fact that Davis would allow the daughter of the President of the Confederacy to marry a Yankee suggests that when he spoke of reconciliation and reunification, he meant it. Despite age and brittle health, Davis visited Briarfield as often as possible. Every fall, without fail, he checked on crops and settled accounts. In November of 1889, he wrote his last words there in a letter to Joseph Davis's granddaughter. May all your paths be peaceful and pleasant, charged with the best fruit, the doing good to others. When he got to the landing on Davis Island, the captain wouldn't put him off. He said he was too ill. He took him over to Vicksburg, but Davis got better, and the steamboat captain, they brought him back down and put him off at the landing. He was at Briarfield. He became very ill again. Uh, he wrote a, a, a brief note to Verena that indicates the difficulty he was having because it's, um, some of the words are jumbled and the language is not clear. They get him to the landing again. He gets on the steamboat. They also telegraph Verena. Uh, she gets word that he's, he's, he's really ill. Uh, she boards a steamboat to go up to meet him. Uh, the two boats meet in the river, uh, and they bring Davis um, to, to the shore in St. Francisville, Louisiana, which is just below the Mississippi line. It's the first place town in Louisiana uh, below the Mississippi line. Uh, doctors look at him there. They say he's sick. He's got you know serious bronchial troubles, which he's had since the beginning of time, and bad cold and all this kind of problem. They bring him to New Orleans, and in New Orleans he is uh, taken to the home of a friend of his. And uh, the uh, news newspapers have a daily watch on him, of course, and he's getting better and he's getting worse. Uh, finally, he takes a turn for the worse, and all probability pneumonia set in, and he died on December the 6th, 1889. After Davis's death in New Orleans, there, of course, is a tremendous outpouring, first in New Orleans itself, where Davis is given the largest funeral the city ever sees, but secondly, all across the South, especially in the press, as the newspapers pay homage to the dead leader of the Confederacy. Indeed, some of this is even seen in the North. Some of the conservative Democratic New York newspapers, for instance, actually publish a fair bit of praise of Davis, the man, not for what he did leading the Confederacy, but of the manly virtues he had shown in the years after the war. Jefferson Davis's body lay in state in New Orleans' Gallier Hall, where thousands paid their respects to their former president. He was temporarily laid to rest in Metairie Cemetery in New Orleans. 
In 1893, the family decided to move Davis's remains to Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. En route, the funeral train stopped in the capitals of Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina, where the body once again lay in state. On May 31st, 1893, Verena, Margaret, and Winnie Davis, along with 75,000 Richmond citizens, finally lay Jefferson Davis to rest. And the Hollywood Cemetery offered to Mrs. Davis uh, not only a, a space for Jefferson, but for her and for the family. And for a number of reasons, she chose to move his body to Richmond rather than to leave it in Metairie or put it in Mississippi. And not only is Jefferson buried there, all his children are buried there, his wife is buried there. After Jefferson Davis died, his wife, Verena, moved to New York City and became a writer. She published her own two-volume memoir of Jefferson Davis in 1890. Winnie joined her in New York City the following year, but died at the age of only 34 in 1898. Verena lived until 1905, only survived by her daughter Margaret, who died in 1909. It's through Margaret Davis's marriage to Joel Addison Hayes and their four children that the Jefferson Davis lineage carries on strong today. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter signed a bill that reinstated Jefferson Davis to full United States citizenship. Jefferson Davis never asked for his citizenship to be restored because he never believed he had lost it. He never applied for a pardon. He didn't want anyone to apply for a pardon in his name. I think he would have thought it was not necessary to reinstall it. He, was, he had taken his oath to the Confederate States, and that's where it was. In western Kentucky, on a rural stretch of road stands a 351-foot concrete obelisk, strikingly similar to the one in the nation's capital. The structure is a monument to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who, like George Washington, was his country's first leader. But unlike Washington, Davis was also his country's last. Over the years, Jefferson Davis has been marginalized and mostly misunderstood. The heroes of the war, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman have taken center stage alongside the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, while Jefferson Davis has been saddled with the lost cause and slavery. Well, I think, again, you can't escape the whole how Jackson and Lee are not scarred by the issue of slavery and how it just completely engulfed Jefferson Davis. And, and because today we find slavery so morally reprehensible, and I don't see Davis ever coming out from underneath of that rock. I mean, it's always going to be there. Jefferson Davis believed in and represented the Southern aristocracy that built an empire fueled by the work of slaves. What Jefferson Davis stood for, though, what his principles were based on, was the framer's original constitution and the rights of the individual states who entered the Union. What most people don't understand is that the government of the United States is formed by two sovereignty, state sovereignty and national sovereignty. In our own lifetime, the 21st century, there's very little of state sovereignty left. Indeed, it's, it's hard almost to come up with an example of something that is not overseen by the national government. But in the mid-19th century, that wasn't the case. In the years following his death, Jefferson Davis was a hero to the Southern people. But unlike Robert E. Lee, time has challenged Davis's place in history. In the same state where his monument stands, the Davis statue in the Kentucky State Capitol Rotunda is under pressure for removal. The damage that is done when you start being selective about history is that you are amputating yourself from a significant aspect of your ancestry and you're only choosing to tell the part of the story that you want told. And a historian is at his worst 
when he reads into the past the prejudices of the present. And that is not history. I'm not quite sure what it is. Maybe it's journalism, but it's not history. Uh, because our job is to tell the story as completely and as accurately as we possibly can. If it offends some people or upsets some, makes them feel uncomfortable when they learn certain things, well, that's, I'm sorry. That is a part of the story. And, and our job is to tell the story as completely as we possibly can. Jefferson Davis leaves the modern world with a simultaneously simple and complicated legacy. He stood for freedom and rights, but like his namesake, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote, all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence, those rights did not apply to everyone. Jefferson Davis was a man of unconquerable principles and devotion to his country. But most of all, Jefferson Davis was a loyal American, and he was an American president. Jefferson Davis's life spanned the 19th century. He was in public life for most of his life, had public trust, offices of public trust. What he did and thought had a lot to do with what this nation did in the years right before the Civil War. And I think his, his life as a person is almost as interesting because he was so devoted to the ideas of duty and honor and integrity and honesty in public life. He's a good role model for just about any politician, whether you believe his principles or not, but the way he went about living his life and saying what he believed and believing what he said, I think are a good example to just about anybody, anytime. You see a person who had a deep commitment to what he believed in. He struggled to do his best by those principles he believed in. And the idea of commitment in the man was powerful. I think also he was a man who made every effort to overcome really serious and terrible emotional and physical disabilities. He never felt sorry for himself. He never became a victim. He showed an example of someone who risked all and sacrificed all for honor as he perceived it for the right as he perceived it, for constitutional democratic government in America as he and his class perceived it. Again, whether they're right or wrong is another case. We don't necessarily have to approve of the cause in order to pay some homage to the dedication with which he and others pursued it. He was an example of a man who never gave up. In some ways, that's the essence of the American spirit. He faced obstacle after obstacle. He was beaten down time and time again. He is a man who went from the top to see the very bottom of his life, and he never quit. And he died, I think, at peace with himself. If you ordered a model person of honor, devotion to duty, courage, and courtesy, you have it in Jefferson Davis.